Hi, everybody. Welcome to this What's New in Asterisk 20 webinar, um, as well as a general state of the project update. My name is Joshua Culp. I'm the project lead here at Sangoma for Asterisk, and I'll be taking you through things. Um, as well as we're going, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to submit them, and I will endeavor to answer them as best as I can at the end. So with that off, let's go. So year in review. We're going to go over the Asterisk versions. So Asterisk 19 over the past year has had 13 bug fix releases, the current version being 19.7.0. Asterisk 18 has, a, has had 12 bug fix releases, with the current version being 18.15.0. And then Asterisk 16 has also had 12 bug fix releases, with the current being 16.29.0. Something to note is that 16 and 19 are now in security fix only status, meaning they do not receive any bug fixes. So if you're on 16 or 19, now is the time to make a plan for getting to a supported version, which is currently asterisk 18 and asterisk 20. However, there will be some final bug fix releases for 16 and 19 that will be coming out soon. Um, after which that'll transition to only receiving security fixes. As well, over the past year, we've had 1,947 merged code reviews across all of the different branches of Asterisk. Uh, and then moving on to the community forum aspect, uh, for those who may not be familiar, we have some forums at community.asterisk.org. Um, basically, our mailing list has sort of transitioned over there, so that's where the bulk of our community interaction happens these days. So if you're running into an issue or a problem, it's a great resource to receive help. So over the past year, we've had over 7,100 new posts and over 460 new contributors. So I hope to see some of the people on this webinar actually join there and you can become one of the new contributors for next year during this presentation. So drum roll, please. The so Asterisk 20 has been released. It was actually released on October 19th. Um, and I have to like to say that a few people have reached out to me to say that they've updated to Asterisk 20 and it has gone smoothly for them. They've encountered no issues and no problems. Um, as well, just a general note, if you are upgrading any version of Asterisk, um, this doesn't just apply to 20, um, be sure to look at the upgrade.txt document and the changes document. Uh, the changes one just tells you general changes and then upgrade.txt is really important because it will tell you things that may impact you or break you in some way. Um, so those are great resources if you are upgrading. And then for Asterisk 20, we had 429 reviews and 42 individual contributors with the number one contributor being Naveen Albert, the second being George Joseph, and then the third being Alexander Trod. So if your name is on this list, thank you very much. Uh, now, just to touch on standard releases versus LTS. Um, I talk about this in some way, or in the past Matt Fredrickson did, but this is really something important to reiterate about how things work. So standard releases receive one year of bug fixes and one additional year of security fixes. And asterisk 19 was one of those uh, releases. LTS releases, on the other hand, receive far longer bug fixes. So they get four years of bug fixes and then one additional year of security fixes. And both asterisk 18 and asterisk 20 are long-term supported releases. So in the case of 20, since it was just released uh, this year, that'll go security fix only in 2026. So it's got a long life ahead of it. So the past year, what's new? Uh, I'm gonna talk about E911 and geolocation, gonna talk about speech to text, some PJ SIP improvements, some test suite stuff, uh, miscellaneous fun, and then also talk about something which isn't really to do with code, but is still important to the project, which is an upcoming move of where we do things. 
So E911 and geolocation. So previously, when you would call emergency services over a VoIP um, connection, they would use your caller ID information in order to actually know your location. However, things are evolving and changing, and so geolocation is playing a part in that. And this functionality allows um, to provide additional information on location for each emergency services call that is placed. And while this work was really done for 911 in the United States, this is also applicable internationally and is likely to see adoption there as well. So this really leverages existing RFCs and specifications and standards to accomplish this. It's a combination of a lot of existing stuff put together to fulfill this need. Um, so it involves SIP headers, it involves XML, um, and, uh, and we've implemented in Asterisk 20 and also older versions. When it comes to this work, however, we provide it to the provider and they have to take that information and provide it upstream. So one of the things is that provider behavior can actually differ with their implementation. And um, I'll talk about this a little bit later. From a marketing perspective, you may see this referred to as dynamic location routing or second level address information. So when I'm talking about location information, I'm talking about an address, including the street, uh, a suite, a hotel room, uh, a floor in an office, an office number in that office. That's the location information I'm talking about. And for our support, we allow configuring it in a specific geolocation configuration file, which is then referenced and used by PJSIP on an endpoint. As of right now, PJSIP is the only channel driver within Asterisk that supports this new geolocation support. And we support um, reference and by value. So for those who are likely not familiar with this, um, in geolocation, when you're passing by reference, it means you've told the provider ahead of time your location information, and they've given you an identifier that you can place in your call to an emergency services to reference that. While with a value, you're providing the full information in your SIP invite. So you're providing that address, that street, that suite, that floor, that office, all of that information. However, we do realize there are cases where you don't want to do this in a static fashion within a configuration file. So we also allow this to be done dynamically at call time using dial plan functions. So for example, you may have this information in an outside database that you want to query and pull the information from. You can then use the dial plan functions to populate that and Asterisk will take care of moving it into the correct geolocation representation. In fact, we take care of the XML portion, both receiving and outgoing. So from a user perspective, that's not something to worry about. Really, from a user perspective, you just have to worry about the values and the information itself, making sure it's the right information in the right format that is wanted for the provider. And a nice aspect of our implementation is actually that you can do things differently on a receiving side. A great example of this is you might have a soft phone running on a mobile client and they use their voice over IP to place an emergency services call. Well, the mobile soft phone client can get its GPS coordinates and put those into the SIP invite to asterisk and you can then um, place them into the geolocation information to send to the provider. If we didn't really allow this, it would mean that the mobile soft phone would also have to implement the complete geolocation um, specifications, which um, can be quite substantial. So some of the woes as a result of this, um, anyone who has dealt with XML um, knows that it can become quite large. So as a result, this can cause SIP invites to also become quite large. Um, thus requiring TCP or TLS. Um, so it really depends upon the usage. So personally, 
I see this kind of increasing TCP and TLS adoption for SIP as things progress. Another aspect is that adoption remains in progress. Um, providers are still getting their footing on this. They're still working on their implementations. Um, and they're kind of figuring out how it works in practice. To that end, the behavior and usage across providers can actually differ. A great example is that at least one provider only allows you to add additional information. You still have to provide a base of information like a street address, a town or city, a state or province, zip code, postal code ahead of time, but you can add on to it in your SIP invite to say floor two, office nine. And really, it's also complicated due to the use of the wide range of RFCs and specifications that weren't originally envisioned to be used in this fashion. Um, a great example is that specifications say, if I place a call to emergency services, I can provide as many locations as I want. Um, in practice, that's not really practical, practical, uh, practical rather. Um, and so some providers are just going with the approach of one location, which is what we've also adopted. So it's still it's still being worked on, but this is going to become a thing even more in the future. So let's move on to speech to text. So previously last year, um, we were talking about speech to text and how it was still being implemented. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it has now been implemented and is available in all current releases. Um, and just to go back and touch on a bit of how we implemented it and how it can be used. Um, in the past, we did add external media support to ARI for ARI application developers so that they could have access to the media and asterisk, but this was not exposed to dial plan users and dial plan users still make up a large portion of asterisk users. So we looked at the best options to serve the dial plan users. And while we decided on a similar approach to ARI, we also recognized that things were different. And so we decided to leverage the existing dial plan applications and functions for doing speech to text. Another aspect is that all of the different providers out there, be it Google, Amazon, and others, um, all have different protocols and mechanisms for their speech to text. There's not really a standard to a degree that they've adopted. And we didn't want to implement all of them in asterisk. Um, asterisk is C, there's not great libraries for doing that. And we didn't want to have to take on the maintenance burden of that. It's also hard for developers to add additional providers. Um, there's not a lot of C developers out there who are also asterisk users. So we decided on an approach to allow this to be done outside of asterisk instead. And the first step of this was defining a simple protocol um, so that an external translator application could instead be the one that connects to the outside providers. Um, and then that outside translator could be written in any programming language. Um, JavaScript is popular, can also use Python. Um, and there exist development kits for the various speech to text providers to actually be used with JavaScript and Python. So we defined a JSON and WebSocket based protocol for that um, connection between asterisk and the translator, um, because as well, everything generally has good implementations and out of the box libraries for JSON and WebSockets and they're pretty familiar as a technology to a lot of people these days. And so leveraging this makes it easier to plug into new outside providers. And that outside translator is really what's responsible from converting from the asterisk JSON and WebSocket to whatever protocol they speak. And then they're language agnostic, asterisk doesn't care or no, and the role is just to thinly convert. Uh, as well, we do have an example of this on GitHub written in Node.js connecting to um, Google's uh, speech or speech to text um, under the asterisk project. 
So if anyone needs an example, it's there. From the asterisk side, we wrote a new module called Res AEAP, or Asterisk External Application Protocol, um, and that implements the JSON and the WebSocket protocol. And the reason we wrote it that way is so in the future, we had the option to leverage that as well in ARI to provide a more friendly um, protocol and approach for developers to get access to the media in ARI. We also wrote a res speech AEAP module, which implements our own internal C API for doing speech to text. Um, and it interacts with the res AEAP to then connect to the outside translator. From a user perspective, you just use our existing dial plan applications and functions for speech to text. The translator provides the results and then the result is available in the dial plan for you to act upon as you wish. Now moving on to PJSIP. Um, PJSIP is a really critical aspect of Asterisk and SIP in general within our industry is also critical. Um, SIP is everywhere these days from our desk phones to inside the telcos to interconnects to even IMS when we're talking on our cell phone with a regular call. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are doing the best we can to stay up to date with it. So. I'm pleased to say that we're now back to tracking the latest version of PJSIP. Um, there was a period of time there where we were behind, um, but we now are up to date. Um, we did have to work with Telu, who is the creator of PJSIP, um, to fix some issues that we saw as a result of updating, but we're now back on the latest. Uh, as a result, we were able to reduce our custom patch set back to a minimal number. Um, we do still maintain a small number of patches just from a integration with asterisk uh, perspective in building it, but generally there's no real functionality there. A nice benefit of, back, of being back to tracking the latest version of PJSIP is that we gain some additional functionality as a result. One of those being TLS reload. Um, so when we were initially implementing PJSIP in asterisk, um, we made it so that transports couldn't be reloaded um, once they were loaded and the, the configuration was set in stone. Over time, we've improved that so that reloading allowed you to update the configuration of certain aspects. Um, a good example is the external IP address information and the local net information. Um, that was uh, support for reloading that was added about a year ago. Um, and now, thanks to updating to the latest version of PJSIP, we can now leverage its functionality for restarting a TLS transport to allow reloading of TLS certificates and keys without having to restart asterisk. So this is really nice if you're using Let's Encrypt because you can just update the certificate on your disk, tell asterisk to reload, and it'll just reload with that updated certificate. Um, something to note is you do not need to set the allow reload option. It will just automatically work once you're on a version that supports it. Another new thing we've added is tell URI support. Uh, for those who have used ChanSIP and seen tell URIs, uh, ChanSIP kind of supported tell URI in some ways, but it would also yell at you depending on things. So we've added support for it to um, PJSIP. And this commonly shows up when you are connecting to providers using IMS platforms for normal SIP connectivity. Um, in the IMS world, tell URIs are fairly common. In the SIP world, it's the complete opposite. So if a provider decides to use that same infrastructure, tell URIs can sort of leak out um, into the SIP side and uh, cause issues. So um, I just want to touch on, touch on a bit that a um, few people in the past have said, PJSIP has support for tell URIs, so why doesn't it just work? Um, and the reason is that Asterisk uses PJSIP at a much more lower level than a lot of other users of PJSIP. A good example of this is if we receive an incoming call, Asterisk itself needs to examine 
the destination to know where to send it in the dial plan. In order to do that, you need to know if it's a SIP URI or a TEL URI, and you need to treat those differently depending upon that. Um, so while PJSIP had TEL URI support, we still needed to audit and add support for our side. So we now support it for incoming and outgoing calls with a TEL URI in the request URI, the to, and the from. Now, the test suite. So the test suite is something that users don't really interact with and some may not actually know about. But in reality, you're getting a lot of advantage out of it. Um, and this is because we have a ton of tests that run daily on Asterisk. Um, in fact, I put down here over a thousand tests covering things from transfers, being uh, blind or attended, um, to normal calling, so that's inbound, inbound, outbound, with or without direct media, caller ID updates, connected line updates, um, voicemail, faxing. We have a pretty extensive test suite. And this ensures that when changes occur, we have pretty good confidence in the impact they have and whether they're breaking things. And so our test suite was originally built in Python. However, from for the developers, we rarely interact with the Python side of it. We've made it really easy for developers to write tests for it just by defining their test in a sort of YAML configuration file. So you can say, I want to spin up two asterisk instances. I want to originate a, originate a call from A to B, and then I, will, uh, then I want to look at some AMI events to make sure that the call succeeded as it should. So underneath, it provides a lot of functionality to facilitate that without having to really think about Python. However, we did have a fundamental problem with it, which was that it was originally written in Python 2. For those who are familiar with the world of Python, um, Python 2 was kind of supposed to be discontinued many, many years ago, but clung on for dear life. Um, however, its time has finally come and gone. As a result, it's been getting harder and harder to get our test suite working under modern Linux distributions. It's also been hard to ensure that dependencies are met and that the environment is set up. So we do have an install prereq script, which helped. Um, and for those who may not be familiar, and this is applicable to asters too, in the contrib slash scripts directory, there is an install underscore prereq shell script. And if you run it under certain Linux distributions, it will install everything it can to build as much as it can of asterisk. Um, so it can be used as a quick way to make sure your system is in a state where asterisk can be built. The same thing applies to the test suite. Um, we had a script there that installed the dependencies, but as I said, things are getting harder and harder. So we had to move it to Python 3. Um, so this is what we did. We updated the test suite to run exclusively strictly under Python 3. We no longer support Python 2 for it. We also updated the install prereq script and also took the opportunity to reduce the number of dependencies that were actually needed to run our test suite and our tests, just to make it easier for developers. We also provided a requirements.txt file and extras.txt file for Python dependencies um, with some helper scripts for developers. Uh, and these files define the dependencies, what version they need to be, that kind of information. Um, and the result is that it works under modern list Linux distributions and it's far simpler to get going with it than it used to be. Um, so for a developer perspective, this means it's even easier for people to write tests and uh, increasing our test coverage is always a good thing. Now moving on to miscellaneous fun. Uh, the message send dial plan application now allows destination and two to be specified separately. The protocol identifier, so in SIP land, this would be the call ID is now available on ARI channels for supported channel drivers. Right now, that's PJSIP. The conf bridge 
uh, dial plan application now has a hear own join sound option. Um, if this is enabled and you join a cough bridge, then you will hear that tone that everyone else that everyone else hears. Um, normally, it's set to no by default, so you don't hear it. There's also now a dial plan function called cough bridge underscore channels that allows you to get all of the channels in a cough bridge. So you can be clever and write some dial plan logic to, I don't know, randomly kick people out of the conference if you want. The originate dial plan application now allows specifying codecs when you actually do the originate. Um, so this was already supported for call files themselves. There's a codex field. Um, and so this has been extended over into the originate dial plan application. The queue module no longer resets the queue and agent statistics on a full load, on a full reload. The queue module now loads queues and members from real time when using all of the AMI on dial plan applications. Uh, previously, there wasn't, um, it wasn't as consistent as it should have been. So depending upon the AMI or dial plan application you used, um, you may get, you may have gotten rather an unexpected result since it wasn't also querying real time. The queue module now provides a queue withdraw caller AMI action. Um, so you can essentially send this AMI action and you will push that person out of their call queue and into the dial plan. Um, that AMI action does allow you to specify some arbitrary data so you can say why you did it and then take action within the dial plan. The read dial plan application can now be told to, to read pound instead of using it as a terminator of input. The receive text dial plan application has been added so that in the dial plan you can receive text messages if you wish. The voicemail main dial plan application now has an R, which stands for read only basically, um, option to prevent deletion of messages. Um, this is a fun one, a JSON decode dial plan function added for JSON parsing. Uh, so for those who may not know, there is an existing um, functionality in the dial plan for curl that allows you to do HTTP requests. So when combined with JSON decode, you can use that to query APIs and then use JSON decode to um, actually get the result. It saves you basically from having to launch into an AGI, for example, to do the parsing and interpretation. The ResFAC span DSP module now supports span DSP 3.0.0. Wildcard certificates can now be allowed in res PJ SIP. Um, this has somewhat of a history in that the SIP specification says you, uh, I believe the languages must not do this. However, in practice, um, things don't always go as the RFCs say. Um, so we're seeing more adoption of wildcard certificates, both in providers and deployments. So we've now added an option um, so you can turn on support for wildcard certificates. And if they're present, we will do validation as we should and stuff will just work. We now have a dial plan function called pdsip underscore response underscore header to allow you to read the headers from the 200 OK of an outgoing call. Um, this does not allow access to headers from um, other responses. It only works on 200 OK. Arbitrary tone detection is now available using the wait for tone dial plan application and also the tone detect dial plan function. The PJSIP registrar, which, is handle, which handles incoming registrations from phones, now has a remove unavailable option, uh, which prioritizes removing unavailable contacts if one needs to be removed. So a good example of this is a mobile soft phone client where it didn't remove its previous contact, but that contact is no longer available and it's actually being replaced. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, custom named log levels can now be set in logger.com and referenced in the dial plan using the log dial plan application. Um, so a good example of this is if you want to better document your dial plan, um, you can specify in logger.com 
I want to create a log level called my dial plan, and I want it to go to my dial plan dot log. And then in the dial plan, you can use the log dial plan application and say log at level my dial plan, and then just log whatever information you want there. Um, and it uh, it helps to break stuff out further um, so that you're not relying and getting intermingled with other verbose or notices or warnings. There's now a last context and last extend on the channel dial plan function. So you can get the last context and extension for a channel. And DTMF based transfers can now play a custom transfer prompt and the extension that they should be transferred to can be set ahead of time. And now um, something that isn't really code related, but is still important for people to be aware of, um, the Astros project will be moving to GitHub. So this means we're saying farewell to Atlassian. So no more Jira, no more Confluence. Um, we're moving on to GitHub. So I'll be issue tracking, code review, code repository, and wiki. This will be a fresh start with no issues or reviews being copied automatically. And we will have new processes for doing releases and other things. So if you currently have an issue up on JIRA um, or you have a code review up, then when the time comes, um, if you want, you'll need to move those over to GitHub to see any continued interaction. However, despite this move, the download server, so that's downloads.asterisk.org, will remain. Um, we will replace it and update it. However, it will retain the existing layout um, and it will continue to be usable for everyone. So you'll have a choice of either downloading our releases from GitHub or downloading them from the download server as exists today. Notice will be given everywhere possible with timelines as things progress. So we're not just going to go one day and be like, hey, today's the day, everyone move to GitHub. Um, we will give notice um, as soon as possible. So some reminders, asterisk 16 and 19 are now security fix only. Keep track of what's happening in newer non-LTS major releases of asterisk. Um, if you don't, you can potentially experience big surprises when you move forward. Um, those surprises will be lessened if you read the changes and the upgrade.txt file, as I mentioned previously. And then finally, Chansip is, is, is going. It's being removed from the tree very, very soon. Um, probably in the next few weeks, it will no longer exist in our master branch, which will become 21. So if you've been putting it off, um, your, your time is dwindling, I'm afraid. So move to Chan PJ SIP as soon as you can. As well, keep apprised of the Asterisk versions wiki page. So if you go to wiki.asterisk.org and you look at the top, there will be an Asterisk versions link. Um, and this will tell you the versions, when they got released, when they're going security fix only, and when they're going end of life. So this will give you um, a better idea of how to plan for things going forward. Um, as well, I'm doing my best to also in the future, um, for example, I believe I put asterisk 21 on there uh, with some expected dates. So you can also see where those might land as well. So thank you. Um, you can follow me uh, at Josh Dent on Twitter for as long as it continues to exist at this point. Um, and now I'm going to go through questions. So if anyone wants to throw more questions at me, feel free. Uh, a comment um, from Lauren. Uh, Asterisk 20 is now in the testing repositories for FreePBX 16. So if anyone in the audience is a FreePBX 16 user and you want to dabble in the testing repos, then you can give Asterisk 20 a whirl out of there. Um, as well, if you think of additional questions in the future, um, I'm not that uh, I'm not that hard to find. 
Uh, when will 20 be available as stable version? So as a project, we don't refer to things as stable versions um, just because we can't fully vet for your specific environment. But you can right now go and download asterisk 20.0.0, and it is a full release. Um, so you can go ahead and use it. Um, and as always, if you do encounter issues, please file issues on issues.asterisk.org. So we're aware of them. Thank you. Um, yep, and then like I said, if anyone thinks of any additional questions, I'm not that hard to find. I don't hide myself. I'm, I'm gonna go for a once here. I'm gonna go, you're welcome. Josh, if, if you don't mind, I'll jump in with something from the sales department. Uh, can I answer a question first? Oh, sorry, of course. Uh, um, when can we uh, when can we expect Aster Cert in version 20? Um, so I don't have a specific date for you, um, but generally I like to let a few uh, initial releases occur. So maybe around 20.6 or 20.7, there might be a certified release. Um, we did just do a um, certified release fairly recently of 18. Um, dynamic queues, is there any progress towards that? Dynamic as in skill-based routing. Um, from an asterisk perspective, that's not currently on our roadmap. Um, and I'm not aware of anyone within the scope of AppQ in Asterisk working on that. Um, a recommendation and part of the reason why we built ARI is to give people the ability to implement and write queues as they want. Because based on our experience, queues are kind of business logic. It's like one of the big business logic things. And it's hard to get people to agree on how they should work and give the flexibility to do that. Um, so from a project perspective, a recommendation is to look at ARI and, and implement queues that way instead. Uh, and now you can speak, Mike. Thanks, Josh, for that, for that information. I did just want to jump in and mention a couple things. You know, I'm not sure if many are aware, but we do offer uh, a few products that are ancillary to Asterisk. The first, of course, being our standard SLAs. Um, Sangome as a company offers uh, standard support LS SLAs for Asterisk. We have five levels. Um, and then I guess lastly, I, I did want to mention that we recently released a new series of phones that were, were built uh, specifically around the DPMA concept and uh, built specifically for Asterisk, and that's the new P-Series line of phones. If you get a chance, please check those out. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for, for letting me jump in there, Josh. I appreciate that. That's all good. Uh, we do have a free PBS question. Hey, Lauren, are you in a state where you are able to respond? I am unmuted. Uh, I see the question. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 or 9 be supported in free PBX environment? Short answer is yes, eventually. We're currently working on a uh, new um, uh, distro version 8, SNG distro, uh, that is based on Rocky Linux 8. Um, expect some news on that in the spring. So uh, we have no plans at the moment to, uh, to move to 9, but that's the next logical progression thereafter. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, any other questions? Since we have a representation of asterisk free PBX and sales, it's a trifecta. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a countdown, people. Going once. Ah. Uh, that's for you, Lauren. Uh, 
Rocky Linux distro uh, based on distro will it will have an announcement in the spring. That's as uh, close as we'll have at the moment. We're, we um, we're working on that basically in full force now with an eye toward the next free PBX uh, release being based on uh, Sangoma 8 distro. The spring, Frederick. That's uh, we have no more dates more firm than that. I could make up a date for you, Frederick, but I don't work on that team, so it would be it wouldn't work, I'm afraid. The future. <laughs> Not a spring. <laughs> this coming next spring. <laughs> Good job, uh, Josh. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, well, if no one else has any other questions, I mean, I keep saying this and then you, everyone, yeah. Will commercial modules be available outside of SMG? Um, so this is another free PBX question. We have no immediate plans to support commercial modules outside of the free PBX uh, PB exact distro, no, but uh, it is a potential future possibility with the uh, the way that things are moving. Hello, Kobaz. Uh, is the slideshow saved somewhere? Uh, not good. I mean, it's in. I mean, to be pedantic to your question, technically yes. If your question is actually, is it somewhere where you can access it? Not currently. Um, however, this webinar was recorded and will be available. Um, um, I uh, I may throw this up on the. Um, on the uh, asterisk wiki. I don't know when I will do that, but we will see. Going once, going twice, going three times. Um, thank you everyone for coming to the webinar. Um, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you at Astrocon next year. Um, so. Remember, keep keep apprised of any Astrocon stuff if you uh, if you plan on attending. Otherwise, everyone have a great day.